What's up? This is Seth Mosley. You're with us on the Made It in Music podcast. We've got an amazing one for you here today. I've got with me Kevin Jonas and Roger Hodges. But before we dive into the amazing wealth of information and knowledge they have um, from launching the Jonas Brothers and all sorts of other amazing artists, I do have a quick, quick little announcement here at Full Circle Music. We're always trying to do everything we can to help out musicians, and our Baby Steps program is a great starting place. Baby Steps is the definitive step-by-step -step guide to becoming a professional in the music industry, and it'll help you learn exactly what your next step should be as you work towards your dream. So we want to help you. If this sounds like something you might be interested in, visit fullcirclemusic.com slash baby steps. So without further ado, we've got Kevin Jonas and Roger Hodges. Thanks for being on the show today. Pleasure. Thank you for Great having to us. Be here. Well, um, yeah, for those who maybe, uh, you know, the, the, the Jonas name goes, goes before itself, Jonas Brothers, yes, that is, you are the father of Jonas Brothers, um, have worked with them from the beginning, obviously. And yes. uh, so I tell everyone that I actually produced them. <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite literally. And, uh, and, and before we dive into that story, Roger, how, how long have you been working with Kevin on the management side? Uh, about two and a half years. Okay. Actually, oh. something popped up in my calendar the other day, and I was like, wow. I didn't realize it had been that long. Awesome. It was kind of busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I love both of your guys' stories, and we've gotten to chat a bit offline. Um, but for those who don't know, I'd love to go all the way back to the beginning, and, and you guys can kind of take this – Either way, you know, would love to hear from both of you. But let's start from the beginning. How did both both of you get started with music? Go ahead, Kevin. <clears throat> well, I started singing in church when I was literally a child, seven years old, traveling. My mother would drive me around to churches in the area, school um, and music theater, those kind of things. Um, Wanted to make it as an artist. Uh, my mother took me to a contest at a country music club in Charlotte. I said money and women. And <laughs> so I dropped out of high school singing in nightclubs, uh, but kind of had a life change and decided to go back to school, finished, went to Bible college. And so my music really centered mostly around a desire to be an artist, involvement in worship, music, uh, working in churches. Uh, kind of Mr. Holland's opus, you know, ending up in a place, wanting to pursue other things, uh, ultimately decided that the artist's life, uh, although I enjoyed it, the artist's life was less a passion than developing talent, and that's what I was already doing, uh, working with musicians and working with artists, uh, and had opportunity to do that around the world. So when I had that realization, settled into kind of helping others uh my kids got involved uh, we were living in new jersey got involved on broadway uh, nick had four shows by the time he was 10 and then he and i wrote a song someone heard it at sony uh, that led to him getting signed and me managing him and then they found out about the brothers um, so my journey really was outside of the family and my own music and ultimately led to me working with my kids uh, and brought in two other guys and the three of us were there for the entire first run. And, uh, pretty amazing. So it, it's been an amazing journey, uh, fun and exciting, scary uh, moments of excitement. You just can't even describe many tears, but uh, it's it's exciting to be part of this industry and want to do it kind of idealistic. So, mm, I love it, uh, Roger. How how did you get into this whole thing? I, I'm convinced that in 1965, I'll tell you how old I am. My parents <laughs> brought me home from my, from the hospital. I grew up in a, a small town outside of Amarillo, Texas. They they brought me home. They put the bassinet on the floor in front of a Big built-in that had probably 15-inch woofers in it, like really nice, big stereo, and played Buddy Holly for nine hours a day while I sat there and grew up. 
And that is the land of Buddy Holly. I mean, my dad recorded in the same studio that Buddy did during that same season and, and knew those players and wow. kind of was in that business. Wow. Um, and I just then transitioned to learn to play Hank Williams songs. He taught me enough chords I could play Your Cheating Heart and sit on the kitchen counter and sing to my mom while she was cooking. And then it just went from there to Van Halen to whatever. And then, and then I wound up in church and playing there. And it, I don't remember a day in my life where music wasn't very important. That's awesome. And, and always been there. I know a big part of y'all's story, you were involved in helping um, start and launch Christ for the Nations, which uh, we are going to do a little bit of a deep dive into later on. But both of you guys, having come out of that setting, what were some of the skills that you learned, you know, essentially being on staff at a church, pastoring a church, being in ministry, what were some of those skills that applied to developing artists, if any? Well, I think it was incredible. Uh, I actually decided to attend Christ for the Nations as a student because they did a yearly worship tape. And I say tape, so it tells you, again, how old I am. Uh, but there was a song on their yearly tape called As the Deer. And I was planning. I had opportunities elsewhere, uh, and music opportunities. And that song just ripped my heart open. And I just rewound it and played it for about 12 hours straight and decided to go there because of that song. <laughs> Uh, and because I heard the student body live, and I want to be in a place that does that. I didn't know at that time I would end up being the worship leader there. And it, it is just, has always been a breeding ground for songwriters and talent, and that's what I wanted. Um, soon found myself in one of the traveling groups, and what was really wonderful for me is I ended up being able to work, kind of co-lead the group with a friend of mine and also uh, write songs for the group, direct the group, do the music as a young man. And that became part of it. So when I became the guy, Roger was there and Roger and I and some others just formed this group of an incubator for talent. Uh, and out of that, we were writing songs. There were other people writing songs. They had their rich history. And we started, we just saw that, that this live tape that we have, it was just going all over the world and opening up doors and opportunities. Uh, and that led us to a discussion with, you know, some, some others. Uh, still, my heart was in mainstream music. Uh, so it was, that was a little difficult to feel like, oh, you're the church music guy. But you still have a heart to go be out there in the mainstream and uh, have impact there. Ultimately, the church music thing led me to that. And so, but <clears throat> really amazing, wonderful uh, place. Roger and I specifically started CFM Music, Christ for the Nation's Music. Uh, still going today. And I think out of that came a lot of great music that helps the church even today. Absolutely. I, I love, I love that. Um, Roger, anything that you would add to that? Any, any skills that you learned while being in that season that apply to developing and managing artists? Yeah. I don't know how many times in the last couple of years, actually, I've, I've looked at Kevin. I said, this is a lot like pastoring. <laughs> well, because when you, when you have a artists are humans too, by the way, and they have really great qualities and they all have, their lack and they all have issues they're dealing with and you have to i think one of the biggest skills of of navigating those waters is figuring out how to manage that because you, you can't fix everybody but you can pastor them and there's an element of pastoring that's in artist management that is very real no question about it i love that so when you are considering an artist to help develop what are some of the kinds of questions that you might ask if you're sitting down with them well you know i think 
we are in a unique position, you know, uh, and, and I say this, I think we have a hard path that we've chosen, but I love it. Uh, some managers have labels that just find artists and are like, this is going to be a priority. They call their friend who's a manager. I've got a top priority project for you and we're going to give it a big push. That is not my journey. Um, uh, I tend to have my antennas go up or Roger's antennas go up. My wife's antennas go up and we are normally working with artists that have no traction. Uh, but there's, there's a gift there. They might be singing in clubs or at church or online. I, th I think we call that discernment actually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly. Yeah. And uh, there have been artists that I've signed and never seen live. And then when I see them live, I'm not surprised that it's just that thing that God does for us with talent that I'm, I'm thankful for, but it's normally a long journey. And so I don't typically ask them a lot. Um, uh, you know, if I hear a song, uh, I, I like to get to know them. I like to know what their journey is. Uh, but now the luxury is they're usually asking me questions. Um, but I do, <laughs> there was one girl that I, the, the, there was one girl recently that I really felt like you need me and man, I would love to work with you. Uh, tr troubled situation, management situation went bad. Uh, I, w I wouldn't get involved in that until it's done and it was done. And I'm like, I'd like to work with you. And I told her, you know, there are a few things you want to look for in a manager. One, you want to find somebody who has gone up the mountain a couple times and taken it from like, I play in my garage to stadiums. Um, and those people exist. But you want somebody because what one of my mentors said in church work is you haven't pastored a church unless you've pastored all four seasons. And I love that. Like you've done Christmas and you've had summer break. You've had weddings and funerals. You've had baby dedications. And so it, it, it covers it all. You've had the start of school. You've had hard times. You've had snow days where everything's canceled. You've had a national crisis. 9-11 uh, when I was pastoring in New Jersey. Like you've, you've seen it all. And there is something to be said for being on that journey long enough that you know where the levels are, you know where the landmines are, you know where the breakthroughs can be. You want somebody like that. I said, you want somebody who, we used to call it a Rolodex, but you want somebody with contacts and not just contacts because the intern who worked at an office can have contacts, but no one would call them back. You want someone who can actually call and have people respond uh, and preferably has a long relationship with them. And you probably want someone with gray hair. Uh, there's something to be said for the fact that most companies are run by people who have a little age on them uh, because it, it allows us to settle a little bit. Plus, you know, I've named some of my gray patches um, after certain artists and moments. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and and so uh, that experience goes a long way. And so I, I think that's the only time I actually was in the position where I want to sell myself to somebody. Like, please choose me. Uh, they didn't. Um, ironically, they didn't twice. <laughs> uh, and the first time I said to them, you know, my concern here is that three to six years from now, you're gonna come limping down the road and things have gone bad. And I'll still think you're great, but you will have lost all those years. And that's exactly what happened the first time. And they still chose somebody else. <laughs> um, and I haven't heard anything about them since that. So it, it that can be sad. Yeah, yeah. Um... Is there a certain point in an artist's career when you think they're maybe ready to really dive into the development process or is it kind of <laughs> different than that? Am I, maybe Not I'm for me. I think there would be for some. I think we, you know, the industry, as I was thinking about this podcast, I think the industry as a whole are controlled by naysayers, 
bean counters, people that are looking at numbers, and they're, it, it, they'll look at your Instagram numbers. And if they're good, but you don't have a TikTok strategy or impact, then that's the downfall. If you don't have uh, existing touring, that's a downfall. If you're not getting placement for songs, that's a downfall. I see it as an opportunity. If somebody has talent, um, you know, my philosophy is kind of a, a tickle it all until something reacts. And when that thing reacts, double down there. So I, I'm not offended that you're not huge. I'm not offended. And I know what they're going to ask. So we're going to do our best to support it. And if we can find that thing, you know, it could be touring, it could be license and placement, it could be merch, it could be social media, it could be radio, it could be TV, it could be many, many outlets. Uh, and as I've gone through all of those, TV exposure, et cetera, some people only break when they're seen. Some people, when you see them, you don't like them anymore, <laughs> right? But you tickle everything. <laughs> and when that one thing reacts, I like to go there because Double I feel down. like if that reacts, it'll pull everything else up with it because they're going to ask. And it's unbelievable to go into, into a record label and speak to people that are high up. And you say, well, you see what's happened, you know, on YouTube. And they're like, yeah, but what, what about TikTok? Oh, TikTok, uh, where we'll go do that now. And so if you don't try everything, you're kind of screwed because that's the reason they're going to say no. <clears throat> yeah. And so I like to just dive in and test it all. I'm not offended by it. If, if they're starting from scratch, I just have this uh, internal thing in me that says, we will find that one thing. If you're talented and there's that sense in me that you can become something, and it doesn't always happen, <clears throat> but if you're talented, really talented, and that sets you above, I am convinced, naive or not on, in my case, I'm convinced we will find the thing that will react and be able to get you there. Uh, along those lines, part of what sets oh, us apart. Uh, I think uh, that's part of what sets us apart. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't think everybody's ready for management. The way you asked that question, like some people just aren't there yet. But if I see somebody that's got bruises on their forehead from hitting that brick wall because they're trying hard, that's somebody that I think, it, it, okay, we've done everything, now what? I love those kind of people. Yeah. Because they're, they're, they realize, okay, I am not equipped to do what needs to be done here to get me to where I want to go. And that, that humility, those kind of people are the best to work with. And, you know, if you, if you find that, that Kevin has a saying. He says, if your artist is not working harder than you at their career, then you've got the wrong artist. Uh, and, and if they're working hard and they're hum humble, then I think that you have somebody that you can do something about. I, 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 want, you, I want to ask you, just repeat what you just said again, too, because that was, that was really good. If your artist is not working harder than you are at their career, then you probably picked the wrong artist to represent. Ah. Uh, yeah, a lot of artists, they find out that you have had success or that you're connected to, in my case, family with success. All they think is, well, that's a tour you should get me on. <laughs> uh, that You know enough people that I can sit back and you can make it happen for me. That person's going to fail. And they're probably not going to get that spot. In fact, that's the least likely ask from me is for me to go to my sons who I managed through the whole first big blow up um, and ask them, oh, please, please, can you put my artist on every tour you do for the rest of your life? That's not going to happen. Uh, it wouldn't be good as a dad or a manager. Uh, I've, I've had people on their tours and they have been incredibly generous, but you, you have to be prepared to do it the hard way. And we do look for that. In fact, we have this group public. They came in, they had prior management and the management, as far as I can see, did the right thing. Tour, 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 right, record, right, record, tour, 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 tour. And they had some big opportunities. They had an agent that believed in them. They built up 
a fan base, although limited. But when they came, it was clear they worked hard. They put the work in. When you see them live, it's like, oh, my goodness, they are amazing. But but we hadn't seen them live when we took them on, which is crazy. But, but they goes back to that question. Instinct thing. How do we fast track this? Yes. And it was like, well, there's a primary way to fast track it. <laughs> it's the hardest path to take. But let's see how we can do that. You've written and produced some great songs. Um, the, we started down that path. It, it was a hard nut to crack, as you can expect. Radio. Uh, but then suddenly, out of nowhere, a song they produced just broke broke out. And that's what I'm talking about. But it also took, that's that's the moment that I think separates some of us. Where a song from four years ago started to react. And within a month and a half, two months, it was, you know, guys, that's acting like a hit. And it makes no sense. It's a four-year-old song. In the old music business, that would have been, the song is burnt. It's already been out there too long. You guys are this. It's this. You're not this. Well, sure enough, all those things were said. And that song just passed 270 million combined streams. Uh, and they are now top 20 at Hot AC. They went top 30 at top 40. They just released another song, and there were 30 New Music Fridays around the world that added that song because that moment of, guys, we just had that reaction. Yep. We need to go do something with this. Well, and and in that season, like what made that difficult is we had a single ready to go that we all loved a lot. And we're oh, like, yeah. this could be it. And we're independent. We're going to get independent radio promotion. And this could be the thing that breaks this band. And all of a sudden, you know, they're going, okay, we need to get this done, this done, this done, this done, this done. And Kevin says, well, what about this? It looks like there's something happening here. And it was really difficult for all of us that hadn't been through this before, especially to put up. And the, you know, part of the beauty of that song too, part of the beauty of that moment is the song that we were so hyped about is the song that just blew up on Spotify and is getting great early traction at Hot AC. Yeah. The very song we, we believed in for radio and other opportunities had to take a back seat for over a year and is now the leading single. They're on a label. They have a publishing deal. And as they're sitting at home, they're watching two songs now break around the world. That's amazing. But it took it took a level of trust. It, they they had to trust Kevin's instinct there to go. Okay, let's see what happens. Because they could have very well said, "Nope, we're going with this song. We're going to stay the course." And and they didn't. They chose to place trust in his instincts, and it paid off. Well, because I, I told them what I believe is there are a lot of battles that you fight as an artist, but a hit will fight most of those battles for you. And if something is acting like a hit, double down on that hit because it'll open doors. It'll bring you an audience. And once you have an audience and you have an open door, then you can, you, you can feed them what you want. They're, they're, you, you have a career. But until you break through, you don't have a career. And you have to trust some people. And, and I can honestly say this isn't a song that stood out to me. Yeah, I, I had to go back and go, what, what are you all talking about? My daughter lives in Texas with her mom, and she she called me and said, you didn't tell me Public had this song. I'm like, what song are you talking about? And she said the title. I'm like, I don't know. It was four years old. Why did we care? <laughs> you know? Right. That, so, was their, that was their old content. It was a, it was bizarre. A, it, it was bizarre. It was also a fan favorite, so that it had that going for it. But it's also kind of one of those God moments where some fan out there, and there's so many little ironies about this song, but it looks like the first person to post it was this beautiful blonde girl, uh, well endowed. And she does a video with the perfect segment of an old song and it blows up. But what was crazy is she received tons of hate for her appearance yeah. from girls that didn't look like her. 
and actually I think now has like an anti-bullying thing she's a part of. But here was the song. It went out there. It went viral. But part of that viral was tons of hate towards the person that originated the song. But then it became the theme for weddings, proposals, promposals, love of animals, love of anything. And now it has been used by celebrities. And it's about to be used in a huge campaign to launch a streaming service. It, it, it has so much life left in it. And, but it started with guys, this is all good, but there's something happening over here. And those are the moments I really love. We have an artist, Melanie Furman, incredible singer. I mean, incredible. And I've worked with great singers. I've had the privilege of working with Demi Lovato, Jordan Sparks and others who are known as singers. Melanie is exceptional. And there's a song that she has that deserves a Grammy. Her performance, before I saw her, I heard the song and went, I'm in. I'm in. I don't care. I don't care how she looks. I don't care about anything else. I'm in. The song is great. And one day she comes and she's been working and churning, trying to get an album together, release music, whatever. And she, she comes with a song that has some Spanish in it. And I said, where did this come from? And she said, well, my dad is German, Furman, but my mom is from Mexico. Well, how did I what? not know this? <laughs> <laughs> so I call a friend of mine in Miami who used to be the head of marketing at Sony Latin and said, hey, Jorge, I've got something. Check her out. Here's the song that won me, but over to, to this. And he listened to it. She went down. She now has a song that's about to crack the top 50 at top 40 pop radio with, with Pitbull as a feature. And she's just getting started. She's number three on the Zumba playlist, all this other stuff. But I woke up two days ago and I went, even though this song is like getting its traction, it's going to open the door. The moment I can't wait for is when Remnant is released to the world. A song that just allows me to just stop and go, this is so good. You know, yeah. when I go into the studio, Roger's a singer, performer, great guitar player. When he played with me and for me, he made me look cooler than I ever was. But I can sing, right? That's my thing. I sang, I was singing in studios, I sang as an artist. And I will tell the artist, this is good, but I can do this. And you're not done until you do something we mere mortals can't do. <laughs> the song is not done until there is a moment where the guy who can sing goes, wow. <laughs> like, the, this is why we love music. And if it's not in the song, you don't have a hit. You're not done. Go back. Keep going. And even with her new song, it was like, it's great. It's a great pop song. It's a great Latin crossover song. It's a great club song. It's called Suda, which means sweat. But Melanie, go do some ad libs. Show them what you can do. She put those back. We put them in. The song just blew. It just became something different. But when people hear Remnant, if you're a singer, you're going to go, yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, I, I just can't. I can't. And that's why I love it. I'm not hurt by it. I'm inspired by it. And that kind of inspiration, like I'll never write a song as good as, as good as Way Over Yonder by Carole King. Yeah. I'll never write a song as good as I Will Always Love You. I'll never write a song that good. I wish I could. I'm inspired by it. Maybe I'll write a good song. I've seen fire and I've seen rain. I'll never write it. And when I hear it, I go, oh, my God. Oh, my God. How did you say that? You know, my son, Nick, he used to write songs at like eight years old. And I would pull my wife aside after and go, he hasn't even lived that. How does he know that? How did he phrase it that way? I'm a songwriter and I'm like, Maybe I need to be in the business side because those people exist who are better than me. 
and that inspires me. You know, we have a friend, Raymond Boyd, and I wrote, uh, When You Look Me in the Eyes, he was part of us writing that with my sons and a couple other songs with them. And uh, <laughs> he came to visit me not, not too long ago, and he was like, Kevin, after all this, like, you still love music. You're, you're, like, you're still inspired by it. When I hear a great performance, I don't care if you're my, quote, competition. Great is great. Yeah. Um, and so I do look for that. Uh, and in this season, as I thought about this podcast, like, what do I want Jonas Group 2.0 to be? I fully expect my artist to be sitting at the Grammys. I, I do. And not sitting there to watch. Sitting there because they deserve it. As my sons deserved it, as Demi deserves it, as Jordan Sparks deserves it. Uh, but 2.0 is, this could be pop song of the year. This could be vocal performance. I think Melanie has vocal performance. But it was just hearing the last 30 seconds of Remnant was like, this is why I do this. Hmm. Yeah, it is those moments. I, I love that you touched on that because we we always talk, you know, we're in a state-of-the-art recording studio. We're producing records all the time. But I always tell people that the best piece of gear in any studio is a hit song. That's it. <laughs> and it's... And a hit song in yeah. the hands of a great delivery. I mean, a hit song, you know, one of my favorites is Lionel Richie right there. Uh, we did a charity event and the boys just brought him over and I'm like, <sighs> but a great song is a great song. It doesn't matter whether Kenny Rogers sings it or not. It's a great song. And Lionel Richie just writes great songs. And when he comes out with like Lionel Richie and all the country artists do his songs or the Eagles are, have a, a tribute album or the album tapestry has a, a revisit with modern artists. A great song is a great song is a great song, but when you put it in the hands of a great artist, what happens to it? It, it, it becomes heavenly. Yeah. Inspired. We would say anointed. You know, we worked with Tori Kelly. Um, and we didn't hit the mark with her, but oh my gosh. Somebody showed me just YouTube videos of her layering vocals, and it's like, there, there are some people. I was working with her, and unfortunately, we were very busy. And I was at the beginning stages of the effects of cancer. So I, I was on a red carpet with her recently at my son's documentary. And I just said, hey, I just wanted to tell you, you're great today. You were always great. We didn't take you where you could have. I hate that I was limited during that time. But when a voice like Tori Kelly comes along and you put that on a great song, I passed her to church for 10 years. And I can tell you, prob I could probably on both hands and maybe only need one, the number of people whose lives were so radically changed that they were probably going to take their life and didn't. And those people exist. One hand, maybe two. But when my sons broke, the internet was filled with especially then young girls and young, young boys that needed encouragement. And I would cry reading those comments because great talent and a great song that hit the mark was changing a generation. And in front of me was more impact than I had in 10 years of ministry every day. Mm -hmm. oh, man, it changed my life. Powerful, very powerful. Um, I'd love to dive a little bit into something that you said earlier. And, and, and for people that want to um, find the songs that we've been talking about, the first artist was a, a band called Public with their breakout song, uh, Make You Mine. So people can check that out. And also Melanie Furman, that's P-F-I-R-R-M-A-N. Um, yeah, she's, she's amazing. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of both of those artists. So, but I do want to get you in with both of those artists. <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll do it. Um, 
I, I want to talk a little bit about this thing that you said, the song was acting like a hit. Like what, what does that mean? What are some of the barometers that, you know, you or labels or, uh, you know, people in the industry are looking for that, that means the song is acting like a hit. Cause it doesn't always have to mean this song went number one at radio. Like there's often very many precursors oh, wow. to that. Well, there, there, there are so many definitions of a hit. So you, you, you spoke to it. Like you, you have pop artists, Flo Rider, very talented guy that has a song that every song he releases sets a new standard at that moment for top sales ever. So he sets a, sets a standard, next standard, radio loves it, the sales are justifying it, keeps it going. But if you were walking down the street, you might not know who he is. And, and in that case, the song is the star. Now, I think he's a star, so I'm not actually saying anything negative about him. I'm saying there was a branding problem. There was something wrong. But there's that side, which is you can have sales, you can have radio, and yet touring doesn't happen. Uh, and hopefully management can guide it. You, you can have what we had with public, which was similar, different venue, which is a viral moment where one person uses the song and the impact of it just takes off and it becomes incredible. And the group came and they said, Hey guys, this old song of ours just doubled in a month. And Roger, you remember the next month they came and they said, yeah, it doubled again. <laughs> our entire history doubled this yeah. month. Well, there's something there. Find out what's going on. And sure enough, it was TikTok. Now, that was before the band knew what TikTok was. Uh, that was the first time I had ever heard of TikTok. This was <laughs> 16, 17 months ago. Wow. Yeah. And by the time we found it and knew, hey, something's happening here, there were one million videos. Now, we knew something was happening, and it had bounced from where the origin was over to Spotify and Apple, and it just started so you have that definition of a hit. You also, and it will kind of create a, a pull that pulls other things with it, but you have data. And especially with Make You Mine, and we're now seeing it really rise. So I called a friend of mine, uh, Lenny Beer, and I don't think public would have broken without Lenny kind of joining Lenny like he's been in this business forever he's the chief editor and owner of hits daily double and I call him and I say hey Lenny I, I think I've got a viral moment going on with one of my artists and he said ah it's not really viral unless there's a hundred thousand streams a day and I said well how about 97,000 he went what I said yeah every day already on Spotify so we started talking through the data and the number that kept coming up as this is a hit was the number of people that came because there were no playlisting for them. None. Zero. It was all people who came, found them, saved it, and added it to their own playlist. They personally owned that song. And it was at what? 70... 78% at that time. 70 playlists. A million. And we were getting 97,000 a day then. We've been over a million a day forever. And it was a grower. And it, 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 it really kind of broke the rules. Well, we had to fight for it too. It, it almost died like three times. Well, we were told it was dying two or three oh, times. Yeah. Every time they would say, oh, our numbers people are telling us that it's plateaued. Well, one, they're wrong. It's not plateaued. <laughs> it's not over. I don't but, know what numbers you're looking at because I'm looking at them too, and you're wrong. <laughs> right. And that's the other kind of way to identify a hit is right now we live in this world, and I hate it. I hate it down to the depths of my soul that the music business has become like the movie business. And if the early testing and research doesn't indicate a hit, there's no marketing for that movie. 
and it flops for lack of support. But if it makes it through the testing to the Thursday night previews and Friday, if the Thursday night previews are not solid, the movie's over and you, you won't even see another ad through the weekend. And it's that quick reaction. And it, it used to be when, we, when I was a kid that an artist could develop for three albums. And it was almost part of the journey that you expected the breakthrough at album two or three. Today, I have had a major label group head say to me, we'll know in 72 hours whether we have a hit or not. And I said, hold on. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have. I think I offended him. I said, you're telling me that the group I spent two years on developing is going to release a song and in 72 hours, you're going to know whether it's a hit. What are we doing? Where are we putting it that you know that? Are we talking pre-search? No, we're just going to put it out. So you're going to put out an unknown artist and an unknown song into a world with no followers and make with an no marketing with money with, with no, no marketing, marketing no promotion, no <laughs> PR, but you'll know you have a hit if people find an invisible thing. Well, yeah, I don't know if you remember this, Seth. I, when I moved to town 10 years ago, half of my friends had developmental deals at labels. They were still doing that. And now that's that doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, development deals very much are, you know, pretty much a publishing deal is a development deal now. And TikTok managers, is, they yeah, put, the, and, they and put the risk of development now on managers, and very few managers are willing to do it. Um, yeah because of the risk, but I can't tell you how many times, including my kids, how many times I have had to deal with politics that broke down a record, had nothing to do with whether it worked or not. Uh, I, my kids were sent on a radio tour once, a radio tour where they visited radio stations all over the nation and they were sent but the radio folks were told, if the Jonas Brothers get one spin, you're fired. <laughs> now, were they successful or not? Well, if you measure it by spins, they were not successful. Did the song deserve spins? Absolutely. Was there an audience? It was rumbling. They were dropped and a month later blew up with a piece of content that they brought with them that nobody cared about. I've had artists 72 hours. I go back to that point again, 72 hours. Where are you going to put anything in 72 hours? Some of the best songs, songs of the year have been the worst testing songs. I stood on a platform once at a radio show that my kids were headlining and they were singing when you look me in the eyes and there were girls passing out. There were signs. Everybody was up and waving their hands all the way to the back of the auditorium. And a radio person turned around and said, I just don't understand why the song didn't work here. <laughs> the absurdity of that moment. It was one of the worst testing songs for that station. And I said, because you didn't ask them. The very people that are in your audience for your radio show love this song love my sons look at the back but they tested it with a very specific group of people that listened at that time to a very specific section of music and everything in radio kind of comes to the middle and if you're listening at that time and by the way at that time the top artists were chris brown rihanna and jordan sparks for pop radio very specifically, the pop side of R&B. So if you were a band like Coldplay, you couldn't break the top 10. If you were the Jonas Brothers, you couldn't crack the top 10. But the Jonas Brothers and Coldplay were filling up stadiums. So the definition of a hit, yeah, if you put it out there for 72 hours, yeah, it might miss the mark. Make You Mine was the grower. So there was no instant satisfaction with that song. You felt good. But you had to hear that song enough, and that takes commitment. That song was not a hit unless it had enough spins to get into your heart. 
until it was familiar. And what radio, how every song tends to start is overnight spins, outlier stations, and that's all good and it's important. And it grows and you earn each spot. But if you make a decision on an artist or a song, evaluating a song that's only played at three in the morning, in the middle of nowhere, and you say, well, it just didn't break through. Yeah, it didn't break through because in that 72 hours, you put it out where nobody's listening. Give me a drive time, one spin. If the phone rings, then I'll believe something. If the phone doesn't ring with a drive time, you know what? Maybe I'll pull off. Maybe I won't because I'm so stubborn. But but at least try something, right? I, I can look at Shazam data and tell you if they're giving us a shot. Mm-hmm. It, you know, oh, we, we've got 40 spins this week. Well, why did nobody Shazam it? Because you're the only people hearing it are truck drivers in the middle of the night. And if they Shazam it, there's an accident. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like it, 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 it literally is set up for failure. Yep. And that's why when people, I had somebody asked me, like, what's the difference between a record label and management? It's like, well, for a lot, there's no, there's no difference. They're execs. They were execs. They kind of move in and out. These people, to be honest, they make me sick because they live to say no. Yep. Great artists are changed every day because they're not wearing the right clothes. They're, they're not positioned properly. But the difference between a record label and management is if you are – an artist loving manager, you have to have a survival instinct in you. You have to have fight. You know, my son Nick is on the voice. And they made fun of him for his little pad, but he wrote down the word fight on his pad. And they all mocked him for having his little pad. They even gave him a new pad to write his words and his symbols <laughs> on. It. But he wrote the word fight and he he, he said, you know what? I wrote the word fight for another artist, but in this moment right now, I want to fight for you. Yeah. Recently, there was an artist we just had to fight for. Because what but if you live long enough, you know where those landmines are, right? And I live perpetually worried. Like, right, Roger? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like I know, I know if we're losing spins. If, it, if we lose spins in a certain category of the chart and we end without a bullet, we have a week to the naysayers. And even if there's money behind it and promotion behind it, if we're losing spins, you only have so long because in the world we live in today, Justin and Ariana are going to release a duet. Jonas Brothers are going to come and Carol G is going to be the feature. Like, good luck. Yeah. And it's a smash, right? Yeah. So good luck. But as those are scorched earth and heavy promotion from big companies, high priority for iHeart and Cumulus and Intercom and all the rest. So they're getting a spin every hour on the hour. And you're fighting for overnight spins for a brand new artist that don't convert yet. <clears throat> yeah. So, so they, if you see they, a negative five spins and you're not fighting as a manager, you're not doing your job. And if you don't know it, then you're clueless about your job. Hmm. Well, I think that, I, I think you that's just, how we fight. That's what we have to do. Yeah. Well, and I think I think there's there's this. Um, you 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 summed it up so well, even just in what you had just said right there, and you know, in terms of what does it take to, uh, you know, make it as an artist. I mean, a big part of that is whether you have a manager or not. Uh, probably even more so, but being willing to just not take no for an answer because the industry, people who are at the top of the industry, they basically get paid to say no all day, every day. Yes. Yes. And, and our job, and this is, this is what I'm learning every day is to make sure they don't have a reason to say no because they're going to anyway. Mm -hmm. And then when they do, then you have to bust that wall. Down. It's, it's constant. It's constant. It's constant. <laughs> so Roger, He's constantly keeping up with the numbers, right? And thankfully, to the point where we need like interns now, that's all they do. But, but a big part of that is, so we're empowered. And Roger, how many times have I said to you, send it to the label, they probably haven't seen this number. Oh, yeah, and you think, I mean, they have rooms full of number crunchers and we said, hey, have y'all seen this? 
oh wow and they're, it, they're, they're ready to kind of go in a different direction because they think it's not working but they haven't even looked at the numbers or it's, they're it's getting some some side interpretation of the numbers yeah happens all the time yeah make you mine and with a wonderful label it takes everyone fighting for it yeah. but don't take for granted that the head of the label isn't hearing because they hear it no so often, especially with radio, they're going to hear no so often. You got to throw them the positives and make it a regular thing. Like, oh, here's here's the update from the artist perspective, and and they might you know go well. That's naive. That's their version of the numbers. We can look deeper, and that's all true. They're they're partners with all these people. They can look deeper, but the reality is, if you're dealing with Sean Mendez. Somebody has to raise their hand and say, oh, wait, wait, don't forget public. We still have public over here. Yeah. We still have public. And, and you got to keep and We understand that because we know the cash cow is there. We get that. At yeah. At the same time, it's our time. job to not worry about that. You know, we, we were not number one with the Jonas Brothers until we were. Yeah. And even yeah. then, we were in a category or two. Right? Not every category. There are some artists, the day they launch, they're the biggest artists in the world. I do want an artist like that, by the way. If you have one, <laughs> think yeah, if, you Bill, if you got Billy Eilish laying around somewhere over there, just taller. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. I, I, that would be a gift to me. We would love that. We'll take it as a gift to you. We'll work with your Billy Eilish. How's we'll that? Se we'll but, send. We'll send her over to you. <laughs> okay, but, but most of the time, it's a fight and. And I, I, we used to look, I remember vividly when Nick was in Annie Get Your Gun on Broadway. And they had offered him basically that when it was free, he would be the new kid in Beauty and the Beast. Solid, packed show. And he was the first call, which he should have been, but they still held an audition. And there's just, I'm watching the documentary on Michael Jordan. Boy, there's a lot of that in Nick. And just the drive. Oh, yeah. And he was nine, eight or nine, maybe eight. And he walks into this audition and they had told him he would be the next kid. Told us, told the agent. We walk in and he walks up to audition and he says, hi, I'm here. Your first call. <laughs> like I'm auditioning, but I know I'm the guy. And he blew them away. He got the job. Like, that that something that says you i'm i'm it that drive um but w during that time my wife said when will it be his turn because we were watching these other kids churn through these roles and we knew there was talk that lay miz might close when will he get his turn well sure enough they gave him the part of chip <laughs> the teacup in beauty and the beast and at a certain point, he's like, you know, I'm getting a little uncomfortable in this box. You know, it was only the head and the teacup that you could see singing in the box. It was a year. They offered him longer. He said, I'm going to be in Les Mis. Again, we're like, well, they just booked it and they're closing. He's like, nope, we're going to quit. I'm, I'm supposed to leave Beauty and the Beast and I'm going to be the guy. And how old was he at the time of this? <laughs> 10 years old. <laughs> yeah. So he tells us, oh, he wouldn't leave on vacation. Our family vacation when he was in Annie Get Your Gun with Reba McIntyre. He wouldn't leave to go with us on our family vacation because it wasn't fair to the other performers. He had to set a good example. 10 years old. That was not, that was nine years old. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> so he then decides, okay. And we said, okay. So we told him we were quitting. A week later, Les Mis says, we're going to shake it up. We want Nick to close the show. Nick was the last child, Gavroche, in the show on Broadway of the original run. But somehow in his head, he just knew it. The drive was there. I'm going to be that kid. He later ended up the love interest. The, he's the only one to play the child and the adult love lead on the West End and 25th anniversary. But it, it was that, like, when will he be? Well, if you just keep plowing along at it and you don't give up, when I found out people would lose their job if we got a spin, was I upset? Yeah. I was, I was upset as a dad. I was upset as a manager. I was upset 
as a, a person that wants things to be fair. But what I did the next day is walk in and say, well, who do I salute today? <laughs> right? Who, who do I salute? Yeah. And then our champion was removed. I walk in the day after. Who do we salute today? Then I'm with the head of promotion and they say, we're going to give you a shot now. Then they get fired. Well, who do I salute today? Like, whatever the conditions are, that's what I'm left with the next day. And I'm going to fight. You have to fight if you love your artist. If you, if you care about how much you've put into it. But there's also that moment that's real, if you've been at it long enough, where you walk in and you say to people, we're all adults here. What's the real story? And if they know they can trust you with that real story too, like, okay, you push us, you push us, you push us, you help get us to this certain point. But also, if they say, well, the song's over, we're done. If we lose it this week, it's over. If, if you're mature enough to be able to handle both sides, the fight and the reality, I think both are necessary. Then, then I think you can really do a good job for your, your artist. Yeah. I, I don't say clients because they're not. Yeah. So good. Um, man, I had I had – you know, some questions coming into this conversation. And I, and I think you, you guys kind of covered so much of it in that already. But the, the thing that I would like to uh, kind of round this conversation out with is, can you speak a little bit to the, com maybe the complexity of obviously having come up being the manager and the father at the same time for Jonas Brothers? What, what, how do you navigate being a parent in the music business? And maybe for some parents out there who are, who are listening to this, how would you advise them to, you know, proceed? Sure. Um, you know, I, I do believe I'm unique, uh, in that as a dad, I had a gold record as a writer on a song with Michael W. Smith. I had my own independent career uh, I wrote worship songs. I was consulting with Sony Music before they started. So most don't have that. I lived a lot of life in the studio like Roger. But I always, I didn't see the conflict. Now, there were times I think my kids did. I didn't see the conflict because I wasn't trying to be seen. I wasn't trying to make it about me. I wasn't living my aspirations through them uh it is heady to to have heads of nation shut down highways for your drive from the airport like those kind of moments to have more people than you can count at a texas state fair and to be in the white house through different administrations as many times like it, it can it can be overwhelming and and I say heady because you can get a little bit outside of yourself if you're not careful and think more highly. My grandfather sent me to Bible college and he said, live like you're at the bottom, even if you're at the top. And that was our mantra through the first run. But I looked at my role because I quickly realized, even though I had experience, I was not at that time the guy. And I needed somebody who was the guy, someone who had done it in a major way. I think there was some humility and just reality in that, that I happened to have because I was around the business, even though I knew a bit, uh, maybe more than most. And so I heard that Johnny Wright was, somebody actually said, he's like us, meaning he's a person of faith. And I was like, hold on. Like new kids, Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Britney, making the band is like us. <laughs> so they set up a meeting and I met him, came to see the kids. Uh, his protege at the time was Phil McIntyre. Um, and Johnny came to see the boys and his leg was shaking. And he said, that's a sign that, you know, something's there. And I got, he got excited and I can't even tell you, you know, it was, he then went into Columbia and said, I'm now working with Kevin with the boys Columbia Records was like, here's $100,000 for tour support. <laughs> so, so there was something to that. 
that I think a lot of the parents um, miss, uh, that walking humbly and understanding the value of others, very important. Uh, and I knew that because uh, I, I tend to be able to assess my value or lack thereof well. Phil and I then started the Jonas Group. So the Jonas Group Part 1, Phil and I then did all the day-to-day. -day. He and I then went and managed the, the, the first set of years with Demi and others. Uh, but as far as parenting goes, I looked at my role in that group. It was Johnny, Phil, and myself. I looked at my role as the dad. You know, so yes, that carried a lot of worry with it, their health with it, uh, a little bit too much fear, which I still to this day kind of wish I had a, a greater measure of faith at times. But when your kids are suddenly thrust in their high school years and middle school years or on the cover of People magazine, and TMZ's chasing them down the street, you know, just that protective part of me was in overdrive for a while. But um, I, I knew my role in the group, and it was to be their dad and to be a protector. I really never felt conflict until the day that uh, they broke up. And that day, I think if there was a manager hat, I, I, it, it, I didn't throw it off. It got knocked off. And uh, it, it was a painful thing to watch your kids struggle. And... I had spoken to Nick beforehand. I was prepared that he was going to talk. I was personally aware that it might catch the brothers off guard, but it was painful. And, you know, they've talked about it in their documentary and been honest about that. But watching it as a dad in the room, I was no help to the other part of management that was in the room because all I cared about was that my kids were okay. And I actually said to them, something they quoted in their, do their concert film recently is, all that really matters right now is that Kevin's children call you Uncle Nick and Uncle Joe with love. That's all that matters right now. The career doesn't matter. The stadiums don't matter. The, that's what matters. And he quoted that recently, and I just couldn't help but get emotional. Yeah. Um, so on, on the personal side, I think I handle most of it well. There were times I didn't. There were times that I, I, I was. Uh, I remember walking in once, and Nick was just like, "I can't do the meet and greet. I can't do it." And I don't know what was going on other than we were all exhausted. And I was like, "Hey, you know, people paid. We got to get up. You know, it's got to do work ethic." And he looked at me and was like, "Dad, I can't do it." And I actually felt like if I pushed him, I'm the abusive parent today. There's a line that if I cross it, I don't know if I can come back. I don't know if I'll ever be able to repair this moment. But everything in me wanted him to be faithful. The part of me that has drive wanted the part that knew the commitments and the people that, you know, the bartering that went into it, the top 40, he was, he was part of the lead vocals. And, you know, I mean, he was, he's a driver. He's the youngest. So very popular. I called his brothers and I said, go cover your brother. They're like, wait, what? He can't go out there today. Well, he was fine by the show, but he needed a moment and every artist will. And part of your job is to try to drive them. But boy, I knew that moment. For some reason, that moment was my gut check. That was my integrity or not moment. Um, now, flipping that, I have worked with a ton of crazy parents. <laughs> like, insanely crazy. And they may know who they are, but they probably don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's the truth. And Because if they did, they would change the way they act. Yeah. And it's... <laughs> I have had record labels call and say, if you don't shut this person down, the group's career is over and she will never be welcome back in this country. <laughs> like that intense. Wow. Um, you know, and I think some of it is there are parents that are living their life, their desires, yep. their failed attempts at a career 
through their kids. It's a lot of pressure. We wanted our kids to do it because we saw the love and passion in them. And there were times that it was challenging and we tried to keep it inspiring, but it's work and it's hard work and kids probably shouldn't be working that hard. Yeah. But a lot of the dysfunction you see in artists is because of deep dysfunction in the parents. Yeah. And so well, uh, it, it's natural for parents to want their kids to be uber successful. Yeah. But it's not, it's not natural to push them and others to make that happen to a point where it damages relationships. I'm, I'm dealing with that right now. My, my daughter's here and I'm, I'm gauging, I'm going, okay, she's 15 and she's got it. She does. But I don't want to put, I'm, I'm, if she wanted to walk away tomorrow, go find your dream. But that's all she talks about. As soon as I want to move to Nashville, I want to do this. Well, you're 15. Let's be 15 for a minute and, and keep developing. And, but I, I don't want to be that person, but I, I do want her to be successful. And thank right. God I have this example that I've seen do it in a very good way yeah. to, to, you know, well, it's not, here's what I would. Here's what I would say, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but here's what I would say is it's not exclusive to music and entertainment. Yeah. I coached soccer and the police had to be, this is yeah. like peewee soccer and the police had to be there because of the parents and it was needed. So what I do think about entertainment and any success that's uber success is if there's family dysfunction it is magnified in this environment. That's a very good way to say that. And, and so if you have a heart for your kid, well, I think we all do. Most of us do. But if there is selfishness in it, that's where you find the dads that are like hooking up with the dancers. You know, that, that's where you find the moms that think they know better and control everything and drive it into the ground. Uh, and because it becomes inflated, but also the fear becomes inflated. The, the, the power gets manipulated. And I, I've seen it too often. And yes, that's going to hurt the kids and it's going to, it's going to show up in the children. And I do believe if there are areas in your life that are struggling, parents or not, and you get into the, this whirlwind, that is entertainment today, especially if it's young, because then the family gets pulled into it. There's no way to avoid that. It's going to carry with it pain and confusion and blur lines, especially where it involves money. And, but the flip side of that is usually the parents have a good heart. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know the business and some of the advantage I have, they don't have. And they, they didn't have that experience. And I usually look at these young kids, <coughs> excuse me, and say, don't ever forget your mom and dad. Don't ever forget their sacrifice. And the parents will immediately start crying. Yeah. Every place they've driven you to. Every time they've waited outside, every time that they've called everybody to get you an opening gig and can't understand why others can't get you one because they did just by sheer determination. Don't ever forget them. Don't leave them out there. Don't ever judge them because it's expensive and it's hard. We were doing this as pastors going into the city where we couldn't afford parking. <laughs> And two of our kids were on Broadway and they were all doing commercials. That's how it started. Wow. We're, we're sitting, I, I would sit in the corner. Roger knows how much time I spent in the studio. I would sit in the corner and Steve Greenberg, what an amazing talent he is. And Mike Mangini, who had done Josh Stone, Fountains of Wayne, uh, who let the dogs out, like is they're over there producing my kids and we'll be like, Hey dad, can you come over and lay down a guide track? And I'd walk over, sing the song, go right back to my corner and prepare my sermon. It wasn't about me. There are times I can listen back and hear myself on the tracks. And it's like, I know where I was. It doesn't matter. What matters is they did develop. They, they didn't need me soon after that, but that early part, my, my position was not, this is about me. This is about my wife. 
we need to be seen. In fact, it, there's a, there's also what a lot of those parents don't realize is there's a tipping point where if you pursue it, when it when it hits, it's going to come like a vengeance at you. Uh, it's going to come and it's going to be beyond your wildest imaginations how unfair it can be. Uh, but sitting with those kids and saying, don't forget them. I love that moment because I haven't met many parents at that level. I've met many later <laughs> that have lost their way. But at that origin, it's all about my kid has something and I need to help them. Uh, and I think there probably should be a like prep class for parents <laughs> <laughs> to keep. And by the way, like if I could go back, I would take that class. A prep class for parents of talented kids to just kind of prepare them for any success at all and how to stay healthy in the journey uh, so that your kids still love you at the end of this, uh, because that is ultimately the top priority. Uh, and the younger they start, the more important that class probably is. So good. Well, I think that is a fantastic way to put a bookmark in this conversation. I say bookmark because I would love to have a part two with you guys someday. There's so much more that we could uh, keep uh, discussing. And you guys are such a great example in our industry of, um, you know, both of us being people of faith and um, carrying that well, being a great example and, and, you know, serving the artists that you work with. I, I can't tell you how rare that is that you really see managers who get out there and fight on the, in the trenches for their artists. It's, it's kind of an uncommon thing. So um, definitely want to commend you for that. But before we close up, um, we always close with a fun part, rapid fire question and answer lightning round. Are you guys okay with that? Sure. Yes, sir. All right. And we can, we can go one at a time. You, you guys, you guys just, uh, go back and forth. What was your first concert? Roger, why don't you go first? And I'll uh, go say. Van Halen, 1979. Outside of gospel music, like, you know, true Southern gospel music, my first concert where I waited in line was Kenny Rogers. Love it. What is your favorite quote or saying? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And Jeremiah 29, 11, you can look up the rest of it. <laughs> I love it. It's a good one. Amen. Um, what my grandfather taught me that I mentioned earlier, which is live like you're at the bottom, even if you're at the top. It was just a defining statement for me. I love it. What is your favorite season and why? Mm. I love the spring because I can't stand the winter. Yes. I, and I love the spring too. I love new life. I, I love when the flowers bloom and everything comes back. What book would you recommend reading to those listening? If you're in the music business, uh, well, I forgot the title exactly. Is it called The Business of Music? It's just a good general overall kind of, especially if you're new and getting into it. It's a very, I read it in college, but it, it, it prepares you for a vast number of things that you'll encounter on some level. Yeah. Um, I, I tell you, I, I go to a book that probably rock my world more than any other. And that was a tale of three Kings by Gene Edwards, just a study in humility. Uh, that, that book changed my life. Very like tiny book, but it just amazingly insightful. Hmm. Love it. And what are two of your bucket list items that you haven't checked off yet? Ireland is one. Hmm. And Probably a band that I 
or seeing an act that I was a part of in the beginning play an arena show. Awesome. Uh, bucket list. Wow. Uh, that should be easy, but um, bucket list is to win a Grammy with one of my artists. Had a lot of, you know, had nominations, uh, but to win a Grammy, and that's part of what I think we're working on right now. I love it. Very cool. And I include, by the way, my kids who've been nominated twice that really deserved even more. Yeah. And that's, and that's honestly very surprising. And, you know, that's a whole nother conversation, Yeah, <laughs> but, um, Kevin, Roger, thank you so much for being on the show. We are going to do a quick deep dive uh, right after this. I, I do want to, to dive in a little bit how you guys started and launched Christ for the Nation's music. You, you touched on it really briefly at the beginning, but I'm just as a, you know, as a fan of worship music and uh, always wanting to know these inside stories, would love to just take a couple minutes to dive into that if you guys are cool with that. Sure. And uh, people, if they want to access that deep dive, they can get that at madeitinmusic.com. Go to the deep dives. Kevin Jonas, Roger Hodges, thank you so much for making the time to be here with us on the Made It Music Podcast. Thank you. Honored to be here, man. What's up? Thank you for watching the Made It In Music Podcast Season 3. If you want to check out any of the other episodes from Season 3, click up here. And we talk in the show about these really cool deep dives with all this extra bonus content. And if you want access to all of those, click here.